My name is Dana. I am with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Probably some of you folks know our organization. Um, if we haven't seen you before, welcome. Uh, we are all about the conservation of birds and other wildlife and their habitats via science, education, and advocacy. And relevant to tonight's conversation, um, the Missouri River Bird Observatory is an associate organization with Break Free from Plastic. Um, and Macy and I are graduates of the Beyond Plastics course uh, with Judith Enk at Bennington College in Vermont. Um, and we're both speakers with Beyond Plastics. And so that is how we know each other. Although Macy is going to be talking about her own personal research tonight. So as a bird organization, sometimes I get asked, why does the Missouri River Bird Observatory care about plastic? Um, and if folks have a little bit of background on this topic, you'll know that it's a major pollution problem. Um, these are albatrosses on a far-flung South Pacific Island, um, and plastic is reaching everywhere, including our uninhabited islands. Um, and we're starting to see things like this. And, and you know, Macy is going to talk about a number of different issues, including human health as well. Um, and so there's all kinds of, of challenges here in addition to the pollution. But of course, I as an ornithologist find this sort of thing not acceptable and hope that we can all do something about it. So um, I would like to introduce Macy. We're super excited to have her tonight. Um, she's a public health professional and now a master's student at Utah State University. Um, her work focuses on the transport of microplastics and current gaps in the microplastics cycle. As a native of Southeast Michigan, Macy has observed the effects that industry and anthropogenic activity has had on the Great Lakes firsthand. Her passion for people in the environment led her into the field of public health, where she worked as a water quality specialist prior to pursuing her master's degree. Though Macy has always strived to minimize her use of plastic, her research experience and work with microplastics have intensified her efforts to find alternatives to plastic in everyday life. Macy is optimistic that continued advocacy and education are keys to fighting the plastic problem. In the winter of 2021, Macy enrolled in the Beyond Plastics course at Bennington College with Judith Inc. After completing this course, Macy was thrilled to join the Beyond Plastics movement as a volunteer speaker. She recently graduated with honors from Oakland University, earning a BS in environmental science with a specialization in environmental health and safety. She is currently pursuing a master's in watershed sciences, sciences at Utah State while working as a research assistant in the Environmental Biogeochemistry and Paleolimnology Laboratory. In her free time, which I'm sure you have a lot of, Macy enjoys hiking, running, biking, swimming, reading, volunteering with local organizations, and spending time with friends and family. So please join me in welcoming Macy, and I'm going to stop sharing and give it over to you now, Macy. Thanks, Dana. Let me get my screen set up here. Is that good? Can we see everything all right, Dana? That looks very good to me, yep. Oh, let me just fix something. Ah. We all love Zoom so much. It's the best thing in the world. Hey, it does allow you to present <laughs> To, to, be here today. to Missouri and right exactly Absolutely. no that's that's better that's better thanks well, why is it going through my presentation okay so yes thank you Dana for inviting me here today and thank you everyone else for welcoming me here today I'm really excited to talk to you all right off the bat I want to address the most asked question I get whenever I enter a zoom meeting and that is where did you get the fish on your wall? Well, that is from the local farmer's market. I won't let you buy it from me. I'm really sorry. I just swear that that's the first question every time I get in Zoom. And yeah, I like my fish. Anyway, I'm going to kind of repeat some of that just for anybody who's coming in a couple minutes late. My name is Macy Gus Davis, and I am currently in the second year of my MS degree in watershed sciences at Utah State University. Um, prior to Utah State, I received my bachelor's of science in environmental science with a specialization in environmental health. 
So pretty much that's a very, very long way to say that I have a public health degree. Um, I have a background in water quality and a little bit of chemistry, which is what brought me out to Utah to look at microplastics. So anyway, today we're going to get into one of the tiniest aspects of the plastic problem that is actually not so tiny at all. I know that Dana recently gave a presentation about plastics in general, so some of this is going to be a little bit of a review, hopefully not too much of it, and hopefully it's enough for those of you who didn't attend that presentation to kind of catch up on where we fall with plastics in general. So a little bit about my research, as Dana was saying, I am a microplastic scientist out of Utah State University. And this map here shows a majority of my study area. I collect throughout Northern Utah, um, which is essentially my backyard. So that is really great. I'm grateful to be doing something around my community. Uh, the focus of my project is to look at our local watershed and assess the fate and transport of microplastics in recreational settings, throughout different seasons, around urban areas, Basically, um, I am looking at how microplastic concentrations evolve from more remote mountain watersheds and ecosystems to urban areas to agriculture as they kind of come from the top to the bottom and what that looks like. So here is me collecting samples, um, sometimes not super gracefully, but I really love to get out in the field, so. And my work focuses on the end of the plastic life cycle, but I want to start at the beginning real quick, just to give you an idea of where plastics come from. So plastics are made from fossil fuels. That is coal, oil, natural gas. And that means, um, sorry, that is coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, today, plastics are mostly made from a byproduct of gas called ethane. What happens is that ethane is piped into large canisters, pretty much, that condense it under really high temperature and pressure. And this makes these tiny, tiny plastic pellets called nurdles. Um, and those are used to create plastic molds of the things that we see every day, like cups, bowls, plates, anything that is made of plastic. And in 1950, we were making about 2 million metric tons of virgin plastic per year. But as of 2020, that number has jumped to 380 million metric tons. So it has increased exponentially. And this trend is only continuing. Right now, we have between 8 and 9 billion metric tons of plastic on this earth and if we continue at this rate or at the rate that is projected here on this graph we will be around three times that by 2050 so 34 billion metric tons or yes 34 billion metric tons of plastic on this earth so you might be wondering where does all of the plastic that we make go well, currently, some of this plastic is still in use. A very small amount is recycled or incinerated, and that large gray block on the top represents the amount that goes straight to the landfill or is discarded in the environment. And about 12 to 18 percent of plastics produced per year ends up in the environment where it is subjected to mechanical and chemical breakdown and turned into microplastics. So what are microplastics really? It's kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around. So let's say you baked a cookie. When this cookie is baked, it isn't going to break back down into eggs, flour, butter, and sugar. <clears throat> You're going to give that cookie to your child and they're going to run around the house and get in the car and leave crumbs absolutely everywhere. And that is kind of similar to what happens with plastics. So once you have a plastic bottle like this, 
it's never really going to break back down into that molecular um, level or to that molecular level. It's going to turn into tons and tons of microplastics. And obviously not all plastics are microplastics. Microplastics are any plastic particle smaller than five millimeters in size and larger than one micron. Um, anything above five millimeters is a macroplastic. So that is any plastic product likely that you have in your house and use every day like a water bottle or and a one micron would, sorry, anything below one micron would be considered a nanoplastic. And those are super, super small. Science does not know a lot about those kind of particles at this point. Um, really quick, before I give you some size ranges so we can conceptualize what microplastics actually are, can anybody drop in the chat any guess on what they have about any of these size ranges? So can you give me an object that might be 60 microns or seven to eight microns. And for this, I'm really looking for that smaller range. If you just wanna throw that in the chat, that would be excellent. And I'll read some of those out loud. Okay, so 40 microns is about a human hair. Anybody else with any other guesses? Yep, 60 microns could be a grain of sand. We'll see. I'll give you a couple more, more seconds and then I'll start to move on here. Don't be shy. If anyone, <laughs> if anyone has a guess, I'm not sure. <laughs> a plastic comb, okay. Oh gosh, I do not know what a wasper molule is, but that is cool. Piece of thread for some of the smaller sizes. Awesome. Seven to eight, probably a bacteria cell. All right, those are some awesome guesses. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give it away. So five millimeters is about the, oh, my mouse isn't working, is about the top of a push pin. Um, one millimeters is about the tip of a pencil. Five microns is one very coarse grain of sand. Obviously, the tip of a pencil or a hair is not always these exact sizes, but these examples are supposed to fall within a range. Like a coarse beach sand is not always 500 microns. 60 microns is about a grain of salt. 40 microns is the naked eye visibility threshold. So what we can see without using a microscope. Um, and about seven to eight microns is a red blood cell. Um, that being said, some of the plastics in my own samples for my research are as big as a push pin, but most of them I must look through a microscope to see. Um, what I see in my samples is usually anywhere between 50 microns and 400 microns. So while I can look at a filter and be like, oh, there are particles on here, I can't get a good enough look at them without a microscope to definitively say that they are plastics. And the craziest part is that there are particles smaller than microns that I can't even see with a microscope. And research, as I said, on nanoplastics has not gone super far yet, but it is starting to err that way and we are learning a little bit more about them. And I know a lot of you have probably already seen this photo, um, but I think it is super important in understanding how small these particles really are here is an actual microplastic. It's a fiber right on the end of that snowflake. Um, and it is smaller than the snowflake, which I think is absolutely insane. So you may be wondering, how do macroplastics get to microplastics? Well, to start, 
Microplastics are derived in one of two ways and then categorized as primary microplastics and secondary microplastics. Primary microplastics are manufactured as macroplast or microplastics. So they were made to be five millimeters or less. This includes most nurdles, which are the plastic feedstock that I was talking about earlier. This used to include exfoliants um, in cosmetics, a lot of hand sanitizers, or if you had feet scrubs, anything with tiny little beads used to have microplastics in them. But luckily, as of 2015, the Microbead Free Water Act stopped this practice. So now what you see, the little dots that you see in your cosmetics are not plastics. Unfortunately, I can't answer what they are, but they are not plastic. Um, and then another type of primary microplastic would include air blasting media for textured car paints. And for all of you parents out there, glitter is a primary microplastic, which is a great reason not to allow it in your house. It sucks so bad. I see it in my samples pretty often. Please don't purchase anything with glitter. And the second type or the second category of microplastics is a secondary microplastic. Secondary microplastics are formed in a variety of different ways. So for example, when you wash or wear synthetic clothing, you get microfibers. And a lot of those are eventually making it into our waterways, um, especially if you wash your polyester or nylon clothing very often. If you have technical gear for camping and you spend a lot of time outside, that's another way that fibers can shut off of your clothes and make it into the environment. Um, tires and brake pads give off microplastics. So when you brake, stopping your car um, and your car or your tires skidding on the pavement suspends microplastics up into the air. And then the last way is probably, I think the way that people recognize the most is when macroplastics like plastic bags in the environment break down due to exposure to UV light, um, water chemistry and other weathering. Um, and this leads to breakdown into microplastics, but also can leach chemicals in just macroplastics in general. So microplastics come in all different shapes and colors. There are four main categories most scientists follow, and that includes fibers, beads, films, and particles. There is a push right now to include tires as that fifth category. Um, a lot of papers do look at um, tires as microplastics, but they can also be included in that particle category. So fibers. I see a ton of these in my samples. They usually come from your clothes or outdoor gear, and there is a lot of blue fibers out there for whatever reason. It just must be a really common color. Um, they can be curly, straight, long, short, tons out there. Um, the second type are particles. Particles are broken down from macroplastics, so your plastic bags, your children's toys. Um, they are pretty dense and angular. The picture on the right is what I believe to be a very, very microscopic piece of astroturf. Um, I don't see that super often, but then again, a lot of my sites are in super remote areas. And here are some other particle pictures. Again, a lot of blue particles. And those are pretty common in my samples. These pictures are actually from my samples. There is in the upper right corner, a yellow particle. I don't see a lot of yellow. So that was an interesting find. Um, and the last types are beads and film. 
I do not see a lot of beads in my samples. That picture on the right where there is a circled white micro bead is actually from one of my samples. That picture is my pride and joy. I do not often see beads. You see a lot of beads in atmospheric um, deposition samplers, whether that is because they settle in the landscape and kind of stay there or they just get diluted in the water. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I don't see a ton of those. My advisor who does a lot of atmospheric work sees tons on a daily basis. And that last part is film. Um, film is similar to particles. It's just a lot thinner and usually it folds over itself. So with film, we're thinking of saran wrap, um, for example. So all the aforementioned plastics may cycle through the environment in different ways. Once microplastics are in the environment, they similar cycle or they cycle similarly to other biogeochemical cycles like the water cycle per se. Um, they make it into freshwater by urban runoff and wastewater treatment plants and then rivers carry them to the ocean where they penetrate all layers of the water column and get into the deep sea and float around somewhere in the middle. Um, and they are pushed into the atmosphere by wave action um, and cycle in global wind streams until local weather patterns deposit them somewhere in a remote landscape. So pretty much there is really no place on earth where microplastics aren't. Even Antarctica, the deepest parts of the ocean, the peak of Mount Everest, your house, there's plenty of microplastics in your house. Um, they're in all of these places. And that means, unfortunately, that there are a lot of situations where organi organisms are at risk of ingesting them. So you might be thinking, if the stuff is everywhere, what does that mean for us, for the environment? And unfortunately, the real answer is, is science is still working around the clock to figure this out. We know a lot of things and we can take guesses at a lot of things, but there is still so much for us to learn at this point in time. What we do know is that aquatic species are at a super high risk. They are constantly swimming in water that potentially has high concentrations of microplastics. So they are ingesting them and breathing them in on a regular basis. Um, and this can mean a few different things. So inhaling and breathing or inhaling and ingesting microplastics can lead to something called oxidative stress. So pretty much when you take ibuprofen as an anti-inflammatory for an injury, you are trying really hard there to reduce the swelling where you were injured. And oxidative stress essentially causes sustained swelling um, on a small level, which can potentially be very bad. It can lead to cell death and mutations and microplastic ingestion kind of on a macro level can lead to starvation or lack of nutrients for some of the smaller species or even just fish. Um, so that is not great. Um, the plastics can also biomagnify through the food web. So for example, if plankton eat microplastics and then fish eat the plankton, they are also eating the microplastics that the plankton ate and along with their own dose of microplastics that they ate for dinner. Um, in addition to the plastics themselves, um, contaminants and algae may be able to colonize on these particles, which can mean one of two things. So the first thing is that biofouling or the adherence of algae to plastics make them look more like food to aquatic species. So where they might have avoided them before, now they have this really tasty coating that a fish or a plankton may want to eat. Um, and the second problem with that is that microplastics have the capacity to carry pathogens and toxins. 
that will be then introduced to the body of whatever organism consumed that plastic. And here are just a few pictures of aquatic species mistaking plastic for food or possibly for the seal in the top left, just a toy, which is also not super awesome. The picture on the right is that bird probably died because they ate so many plastics they couldn't eat fish. And then they were also pretty much starved of nutrients because they were eating plastics instead. So pretty much every species you see consumes plastic, especially if they're around an aquatic ecosystem. Soil dwellers and other land animals are also exposed to microplastics. Um, atmospheric deposition or recreation may play a role in this in some more remote environments. But in agriculture, biosolids from wastewater treatment plants, so when I say biosolids, I mean organic matter um, that is left over and then composted into soil, those are usually placed onto fields. Um, and of all microplastics coming into wastewater treatment plants, 99% of those are captured in biosolids and the other 1% is discharged in the waterways. So even though we're capturing that 99%, it's still ending up back out in the environment, which is not super great. Um, and even though agricultural areas are not natural ecosystems per se, it's obviously a really important food source for us and an ecosystem for many different types of species. Um, so when microplastics get into the soil, they have the ability to decrease, decrease the soil structure and make soil more porous in places that maybe it shouldn't be. So especially in drought stressed areas where making that soil more porous and we might lose a lot more of the water that we really need. Um, microplastics can harm microbial communities and fungi that are beneficial to plants and animals. A lot of studies have documented the effects that microplastics have on earthworms and when they consume them it may be basically lead to them starving to death. Um, and if they live long enough, it could lead to possible reproductive issues due to the chemicals that are in the plastics and the high dosage that an earthworm would receive by burrowing through pretty much microplastic pollution. And Plants may be able to uptake microplastics or at the very least the toxins that the plastics might carry. Animals can consume microplastics and there are just a lot of negative effects to microplastics infiltrating into terrestrial ecosystems. As for microplastics in humans, we definitely aren't safe from these particles. Um, there was an old study that said a credit card a week has, is about, or we are ingesting or inhaling about a credit card of microplastics per week. But this has recently been updated in a new study. So now it's maybe more like half a credit card, but that is still quite a bit of plastics for us to be consuming. Um, you are often eating them with your food in some way or another. You might eat them directly from your food. Um, just a side note, if you're a, a fan of seafood, you may be erring more towards that credit card a week amount um, because aquatic species are subjected to high concentrations of microplastics. Um, the packaging your food may come in or comes in may shed or leach or even just dust falling from your clothes or around your house and onto your food is a part of ingestion. And that is a great way for microplastics to be introduced to your food. I have personally tried to reduce plastic in my kitchen. Um, I think that if there's anywhere in your home that you are trying to reduce plastics, the kitchen is number one. You can reduce chemical leaching um, and microplastic exposure a lot by doing that. 
when we ingest plastics, the gut microbiome may be at risk. So you have this really happy family of bacteria in your stomach and having small plastics in there might hurt them. Um, as I talked about earlier, having microplastics in our own bodies could be a driver of oxidative stress and mutations and eventually cell death. We are constantly inhaling microplastics. Um, Right now, science doesn't really know what this might mean, but I think of it usually as a possible sustained inflammatory response similar to if you were inhaling asbestos. Um, that is a super extreme example for the microplastic problem, but it would be a similar mechanism. So your lungs are super delicate. And when an abrasive agent like asbestos or plastics make their way in, it's super easy to cause damage to those cells in the lung. Um, and this is another place where oxidative stress and a sustained inflammatory response could lead to mutations or cell death. Um, the average person is likely not at risk. So you at your kitchen table are probably okay. Um, and are not going to be subjected to these kinds of issues. But it might be a different story for somebody who works in a textile factory per se, and who are around plastics that are flying up all the time. And if you do work in a situation like that, it's just really important to wear your personal protective equipment and masks. Um, some other microplastic exposures in the body one study just found them in human placentas, and this might infer that they can, well, this doesn't just infer, but it kind of says that microplastics can cross cellular barriers and maybe even the special protective barriers that we have in our bodies, like the placental barrier. Um, and again, this doesn't include microplastics we, or nanoplastics. We really don't know how those could possibly travel through the body. So what can we do about this? Um, the microplastic problem is the same as the overall plastic problem. So while we can't really do anything right now directly about microplastics, we can really target that plastic, the overall overarching plastic issue. And when you're doing this, it's super important to consider false options. So unfortunately, only 9% of plastic or about 9% ever made has been recycled. Um, this means even if you are doing everything correct, most of the plastic that you put in the bin won't be repurposed into something else. I actually saw somebody in the chat earlier asked if we can or if we should be putting all of our plastics in the recycling, and I can elaborate more on this earlier, but the best chance of getting your plastic recycled is only including number ones and twos that are super clean and don't have any labels. But yes, could definitely talk about that more after this. I would love to touch on it again. Um, biodegradable plastics are not the knight in shiny armor that we had hoped for. Um, these plastics are often made out of corn or other agricultural byproducts and are similar in structure to regular plastics made out of fossil fuels. So more often than not, these products just break down into microplastics themselves. Um, and oftentimes, if they are really compostable at all, they require the help of an industrial composter and very specific conditions. Um, so unfortunately, they won't break down in your own home, compost pile, or anywhere in the environment. So I love this analogy. If you have a bathtub that is overflowing and the tap is still running, but the only thing you have to bail it out with is a spoon, the first rational thing you're going to do here would be to shut off the tap. Um, and that is kind of where we're at with the plastic problem right now. We're trying to fix it, but plastic is being produced faster and faster, way more quick than we can handle. Um, so what we really need to do is shut off the metaphorical tap and target plastics on a higher level. 
So there's a number of ways to do this. My biggest go-to is education. I think it is super important to educate the people around you, young or old. Everyone should know what plastics are doing to our environment. Um, educating people on how to reduce their personal plastic use, where plastics come from and where they go, um, because a lot of people don't think beyond plastics ending up in the garbage, and how they can join you in making a systemic change is a great place to start. Participating in beach cleanups, um, community rally events, and supporting organizations like Beyond Plastics. Um, I'm going to give a little plug here. The Beyond Plastics movement is one that is based on fact and they really know how to get things done. So I highly encourage you to join them and check out the website. Um, Dana and I are both volunteer speakers for Beyond Plastics and I've just had a great experience with them and I really believe in what they are doing. Um, Judith Ank, a former regional administrator, um, hosts a Beyond Plastics course. I'm sure Dana has plugged this at some point. And it is a great place to start as far as educating yourself to educate others. Okay, plug is over, um, but I would happily answer any questions about that once we are finished up here. And most importantly, um, supporting legislation like the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act and plastic trifecta bans can be a way to reduce plastics in your community and on a national level. Um, I would say starting at a local level is the best way to start. Make connections directly with your city and state politicians and let them know where your vote falls. If they're going to support plastic, you're not going to support them. Um, the battle against plastic is super difficult and sometimes really, really sad. Um, I say that as it is my day in and day out occupation right now. Um, but something that really keeps me going is remembering that there are so many people out there that care about this. Um, scientists, young people, and any of you here today who wanted to watch this presentation are all in the fight to end the plastic problem. And we are making progress, even though sometimes it seems a little tough. And with that, thank you so much to Dana for inviting me to speak to you guys today. You're all super lucky to have her as your fearless leader. She's doing awesome things and I love being able to chat with her about the plastic problem. Um, it makes my heart really happy that so many people are interested in the plastic problem and in microplastics. Sometimes it's a super lonely field to be in as a scientist, but together I really think that we can make a difference and hopefully see a reduction in plastic production sometime soon. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I would love to take them. And yeah, these pictures are just placeholders and I think they're really fun. No real relevance to them, not me sampling or anything. But yes, thank you and I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Macy. You have some... Pretty, pretty serious questions here. Um, oh, you were wow. right. I'll you did mention this, um, Lynn put in the chat quite early on about recycling ones and twos. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything more about that. Um, you did speak of it, so yeah. up did, to you. Lynn, and do you have any other questions about recycling plastics? I'd love to elaborate on that if it would be helpful or if I touched on it. I can move on to the next question, whatever you think is best. She was up there at the very beginning and, and yeah. just said, should we only recycle ones and twos? And I mean, those yeah. are pretty much the ones that get recycled most of the time, right? Pretty much, yeah. So she says, I would love to hear more. Um, yeah, ones and twos. Again, a lot of plastics aren't currently recycled. <laughs> no glitter, I, I love that. Um, but a lot of plastics aren't currently recycled. Um, there's mostly a market for ones and twos. You can check in your area to see if there's a market for 
most commonly like number five plastics. Um, but yeah, not a ton more to say about that. It hurts me. Um, when you have like a number four, six or seven, um, those just have to go in the landfill. That is the best place for them, so. Macy, I wanna comment really quick because I, I feel like I learned this in Judith's class. Maybe you yeah. did too, you might've known it already, but when they have that ch chasing arrows that we all associate with recycling, they that is put on all these products, even as you just said, number fours. Mm -hmm. It's on ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, sixes, and it leads us all to believe that all of those things can be recycled, and that simply is not, not true. true. It's, not true. So. <laughs> it's unfortunate. I'm laughing, but it is, it's, uh, it's just such a mess. Um, they should not be there, in my opinion, but okay there are awesome some questions. there are some questions in the q a yeah. as well um that came in so if you can see those right no problem yes yeah. i will check those out first because they're all in order so hannah asks in regard to how microplastics cycled is the amount distributed through precipitation particularly substantial how potent of a microplastic concentration would be in typical rainfall or snowfall and does the amount get diluted throughout different stages of the cycle awesome question uh, my research does deal with the microplastic cycle my advisor got into microplastics with an atmospheric deposition um, paper and she found that about a hundred or no a thousand tons of microplastics were being blanketed across remote areas of the American West each year. Um, so it is pretty substantial. Obviously, it's not something you're going to be able to see on the ground like snow, um, but it's there and it's integrating into our soils and waterways. Um, how potent of a microplastic concentration? That's a question that we're actually trying to answer with my own research. It's not super defined yet. Um, and does the amount get diluted through different stages of the cycle? Well, that depends on where you look. So with my research, I'm kind of also looking at seasonality and waterways. Um, and we're thinking that in the summer, when we see lower flows, we might see more like a higher concentration of plastic. Um, and then when there's higher flows in the spring, we will see a lower concentration, um, but that doesn't take into account what the flow looks like in these areas. Um, so when you add the flow to the concentration measurement, it gives you a flux of how many plastics are running through that area at any point in time. So that is still being kind of investigated. Uh, but there are definitely papers out there that have looked at it before. Great. Um, I answered a question from Joe about the um, proportion of a credit card that we are all eating yeah. or breathing <laughs> weekly. Um, and so that's in the Q&A, just kind of answered. Um, and then there's all kinds of others, Macy. <laughs> yeah, I think, okay, so... There is a question, it says, so I already have plastic storage containers for my kitchen. Should I get rid of them and replace with alternatives like silicone and glass, or are they fine to keep using? I'm nervous about the leaching thing. And that is a great question. Um, somebody also asked earlier in the chat about whether or not silicone is a good alternative. Um, so I am a big fan of doing what you can. Obviously we don't have, or not all of us have the money, especially me as a college student, to run out and replace all my Tupperware all at once. Um, the change that I've made is a really gradual one. Um, honestly, I started by, if I get spaghetti sauce with glass jars, I started by saving those um, 
spaghetti sauce containers and cleaning them out and using them as storage units. Um, so that's an awesome way to start. I don't think you need to run out and uh, replace everything. I would just say avoid microwaving in them if possible or heating food up in them. Um, if you need to store stuff in the fridge, plastic is okay. Um, if you need to bring something to work, plastic is okay. It's not something that happens overnight. You being subjected to all of these chemicals, it's not gonna give you cancer tomorrow. It's a very long process. Um, and the amount of leaching that we see is really maybe not that much. I would just say, if you can get more glass containers um, or silicone alternatives, honestly, I would err more towards glass and metal than silicone. Um, I think silicone is great, but who knows? We might learn more about that in a few years. But yes, if you can get glass containers, get them. If you can't, just make that change slowly. It's not a tomorrow thing. Macy, it, related to that, we have a number of different questions in the chat and in the Q&A that are sort of like, what do I do with the things I already have, right? Like yeah. disposal <laughs> of things and, and even, you know, trash bags and, and plastic, the inevitable plastic shopping bags mm -hmm. um, in the era of COVID, there's other stuff. So um, there's a number of folks asking about what they should do with their existing items. Yeah, so good question. Um, if you have plastic Tupperware currently, you can use that to store literally anything other than food in your house. So if you, yeah, if you're into crafting and you have a lot of crafts, maybe try to repurpose that way. Um, something that I do with a lot of my leftover plastic containers is I make a lot of baked goods. I love to give them to friends and family. Um, so they often get baked goods in plastic um, because they're not going to heat that up in the microwave and I'm not going to use it. Um, so that's a good way to kind of make sure that or reduce it being in your house and then your friends and family, like my friends have kind of a swap going on. When we make baked goods, we use those containers um, or donate them. Somebody out there might use them. Um, as I said, if you're trying to find Tupperware at a Salvation Army per se, and that's what you can afford, somebody would be so grateful to have that because yeah, Tupperware is expensive or just throw it out, recycle it appropriately. There's not a lot of great answers to that, um, but we can try to repurpose in different ways. Dana, if you have any questions that you're seeing, just- <laughs> I just, I do, wanna, I do wanna remind folks though, that this is like, this is super awesome. I'm, I'm very excited that you've got a lot of compliments and a lot of um, questions. We are going to stop at seven, though, just to be, you know, respectful of everyone's time, including Macy's time. Um, so with that being said, let's see. I, it's it's up to you. There's still a, a bunch in, in both places. Okay. I found a good one. Um, is it true that commercial fishing nets account for the majority of plastic in aquatic systems? So the majority of plastic in aquatic systems really comes from the land. Um, so rivers or anywhere there's a city or just population in general, um, plastic waste is washed into rivers and those rivers carry plastic out to the oceans. So a lot of the plastic waste is actually coming from on land, but commercial fishing nets do contribute a large amount of plastic to aquatic ecosystems. Um, okay. Macy, here's one that's sort of related. Is there much difference in the accumulation of microplastics in freshwater versus oceanic organisms? Ooh, I, organisms. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so that's super interesting. I like that question. Um, let me say, in the ocean or marine, so like oceanic microplastics are different than freshwater microplastics in the ways that they travel. So 
when you're looking at lakes or the ocean, a lot of microplastics travel horizontally. When you're looking at freshwater resources like rivers, um, the plastics are traveling vertically. So they are flowing with the river. Um, this might affect how um, aquatic species ingest microplastics. Um, that's a really hard question. I think just generally aquatic organisms or any marine organisms um, around these ecosystems are subject to ingesting them um, because microbes and any other organic contaminants that would adhere to plastics will adhere pretty much in either environment. You might see a different type of like contaminant in an oceanic area than you would in a freshwater ecosystem, but there's still always going to be something, um, you know, that these organisms kind of run into. But yeah, I hope that was a good answer. That's a hard one, but it was a really good question. There's a question that asks, um, while fire smoke toxins, not just in ash fall, so microplastics may be similar in weather dispersal. Yes. So microplastics get suspended into the atmosphere one way or another, whether it's when we stop a car and our tire wear particles fly up, or if you're running your washer and dryer and the dryer spits out the side of your house, that can put microplastics into the atmosphere. Or if you're by the ocean, those waves can kick microplastics into the atmosphere. So they get up there and they're in that global weather pattern, kind of in a way similar to wildfire smoke. Um, and then they're just deposited when there is a lull in the weather system or if there's rain, any sort of precipitation. So similar, um, but not the same, I would imagine. I am not a wildfire smoke expert. <laughs> In that same vein, how much plastic is in the smoke from forest fires? Um, good question. It hasn't been quantified, I imagine, quite a bit. If there is anything plastic that is burning, it's being pushed up into the atmosphere with the smoke and other particles. Um, Macy, there's an interesting question. Um, about so Joe brings up and I just thought whether this can be answered or not you might know the answer um but he asked what are the aftermarkets for plastics now that China isn't taking it anymore and I just I wanted to highlight that question because folks might not know that we used to send a lot of our recycling um to China who stopped taking it in 2018 um and in this vein, I really highly recommend, if you all haven't seen already, the movie The Story of Plastics, which amongst the you know, production exactly. issues around plastic, it gives a really it gives a lot of information about like what actually happens when we send something to be recycled. So um, I know a little bit about this, but do you know the answer? Like who's taking our recycling now that China um, is not? I think you answered that as well as I would be able to answer that. Um, I think a lot of it is just piling up in like our yes, waste recovery like facilities. So yeah, um, there's not a good place to put it right now. And we don't really have the means to recycle in a lot of our municipalities. Um, so yeah, that's, you answered that great. <laughs> and there's not, and there's not a lot of market for it because of the things that you described about the making of nurdles, right? And the mm -hmm. feedstock that goes into virgin plastic is cheaper. very cheap right now. Yeah. Right. It's yep. cheaper to make new stuff than it is to repurpose, which is unfortunate. Mm. Um, there's an awesome question by Roger. Is there a way to digest or transform the base component of plastic? Um, so there have been a lot of studies on, or you might hear about it every once in a while in the news, like, oh, we have this microbe and it's going to eat the plastics and break it down to its base components. Um, unfortunately, those are lab experiments. They likely can't be redone on a larger scale. Um, 
they sound great. It's all really exciting. And maybe one day that will be a part of the answer, but I don't really think that there is a way to get that done right now. What else? Macy, yeah, probably one, minutes. probably one, yeah, one more. And to comment, uh, Laura wrote to, I think it just went to you and I, um, she said, where do we begin? Is there a list that consumers can follow since it's overwhelming? And it is, there's a ton of information. Um, we'll send out a follow-up email to everyone and it'll have some more resources for your perusal. So just wanted to add that. Got another question from Diane. So this will be our last one and it is a great one to end with. Um, as we learn more about the dangers of so many things that were so common, how do we deal with disposal? Um, and she says, I have glitter from projects over the last decade and also a box of plastic straws that need proper disposal. So many things that need to be dealt with. So as I was saying um, before, I think it's so important since these things are already made and they're already in possession, not to waste them. Um, you can use them still. I would just say eventually phase away from that. Um, you can give them away. Lots of local food banks will take plastic straws. Like these are important things that people need and use every day. Um, we are just lucky enough to be able to consider using the alternatives. Um, so if you have leftover stuff, I highly encourage you to donate it. Um, but if it's stuff that you're like, man, this, this uh, Tupperware I have has been microwaved a thousand times and it is yellow and gross, just put it in the garbage because um, likely it can't be recycled. Um, I know it sucks. It sucks to put plastic in the garbage. I hate it, um, but that might just be our best option for right now. Hopefully we see different things in the future, but yes, great questions. Great webinar. Thank you all for coming and Dana. <laughs> hey, thanks, Macy. Thanks, my friend. We've got some great comments for you in the chat. Um, Eye-opening. <laughs> People learned a ton. That's so great. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I was really excited as Macy was to see that there are a lot of people that are really interested in this topic, which gives us a lot of hope, huh? Yes. So, all right. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Macy, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Have a great one, everyone.